sing songs of praise and to remember our Savior in the communion. I'd like to welcome you if you're visiting with us. We appreciate your presence and invite you back at any and every opportunity. We've started a, a series of lessons that is entitled CrossFit and it addresses uh, our spiritual fitness every year at this time. Uh, or maybe a little bit before this time, we think about our, our fitness as it uh, pertains to our bodies. We oftentimes set goals and, and resolutions as to things that we can do to make our physical fitness better. And uh, certainly we learned last week a, a few things about that. As we look uh, at where we are spiritually, uh, we've determined that our spiritual fitness is most important in our lives. Yes, it is good to, to take care of our bodies, and, and our bodies are certainly vessels and, and the temple of the Lord. And we, we do need to be smart and to, and to take care of our bodies, but we can determine from Scripture and from um, reading the Bible that our spiritual fitness is certainly more important. The things that we looked at last week as it pertains to exercising our brains in the Lord and, and studying and, 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 and doing the work of the Christian and focusing our time and attention and giving a proper diet uh, of, of uh, the Bible and exercising self-control. These things are the basis and foundation of, of Christianity and spiritual fitness. And in this series of lessons, we see that working out our minds and uh, strengthening our, our faith is, is something that certainly uh, is the direction that the Bible takes us as a Christian, as a faithful Christian. And no series of lessons about physical or fit or spiritual fitness um, is going to be worth its salt without a lesson on the cross. It all begins on the cross and and we see and maybe you've heard uh, the phrase no pain no gain and, and it certainly uh, is true in uh, the physical fitness world that it takes a lot of pain and suffering <laughs> to, to get physically fit if you hadn't worked out in five or ten years and you go out there and maybe you try to work out and the next couple of days are absolute misery I can assure you of that there, there is pain involved with change in our spiritual or, or physical bodies. There is also pain involved in our spiritual life, in our spiritual bodies. And that suffering and that pain was paid one time, once and for all, Jude 3, by Jesus Christ on the cross. And we see in the pain and the suffering of Jesus on the cross the ultimate gain that we get we have in the grace and mercy and blessing of forgiveness of our, of our sins and an inheritance in heaven. As we continue our lesson in CrossFit, we see that no spiritual fitness plan can exist without the suffering of Jesus on the cross. And it's in the conviction of the pain and suffering of Jesus Christ where we find our motivation to live for Him. Yes, He rose on the third day and there will be in, in the future messages about the resurrection. And certainly that is a, a biblical topic and a, another basis for our love for Him. But it's when we look at that cross and we find what Jesus actually went through, where we find the motivation to remain faithful and to be blessed by what He did and what He gave for our lives. So let's look at the cross this morning and look at the motivation and the example and the suffering that He paid. His suffering was horrible. Now Jesus suffered in all ways like we did. He was tempted, He was tried, He was mocked. He was uh, treated in a very, very bad way. Jesus, in the time that he lived, and we look in different passages, he experienced hunger, he experienced poverty, he experienced rejection, he experienced a lot of things that we experience in our daily lives. And he conquered every single one. He was tempted in every way, just like we are, yet he was without sin. 
He was a spotless lamb, a spotless sacrifice. And it is in the suffering of Jesus Christ where we find our motivation. And we find our motivation. I want to look at just a few things that we can see as we see Jesus suffering on the cross we can see a few things from that. And I just want to warn you, this is a difficult sermon. It's hard to preach. It's hard to listen to. I try to soften these things as best I can. And some may call me a lot of different things for maybe crazy in the head for starting out with a tough lesson like this at a new work. But no preacher or evangelist worth his salt goes without preaching the cross. It must be preached. I, for one, like to build in elements of the cross into every lesson. But it's certainly a difficult lesson. And I want want to cushion that by saying sometimes I make up for that and try to to get through that by being loud, forceful, boast, not boasting, but but, um, a little bit more venomous when it comes to that because that's a nervous tick that I have. And it's how I get through things. You see what I did there? So don't take that in uh, like uh, people, some, sometimes from one person, are you mad at me? <laughs> are you mad at us for some reason? No, that's just how I handle it. If I, if I don't, I break down. Many times in lessons on the cross, we see a lot of emotion. And that's, that's okay. Emotion from you, emotion from me. Think about Christ and what He went through. As we look, at the pain and the suffering of Jesus Christ, we see the suffering of Jesus can be seen in His concern. It's, it's very interesting to me that when we see Jesus Christ in John chapter 18, we see that after His last meal, Jesus goes to the Garden of Gethsemane and in order that His death sentence can be carried out. And there's a... a a squadron of soldiers that follow him, uh, estimated around 600 people, the Pharisees and chief priests, all were armed. They had swords. They were armed and very dangerous. And uh, Jesus, his chief concern was for his disciples. Now, if someone were coming after me, if the SWAT team pulled up and there were 600 law enforcement out front and they had AR-15s and all these different things and they, they knocked on the door and they said, we're here for bowling, we're here to get Mr. Bowling, we got you surrounded, I would be a little bit afraid. And I, I would not know why they were doing it, but I would still, there would be fear in my heart. It must be that there was fear. Jesus knew everything that was going to take place. And it must have been that there was a sense of dread in his mind. But if you look at John chapter 18 with me, I want to point something out. And we see his concern for you in this passage. John chapter 18, beginning in verse 2. We see, and Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. And Judas, having received a detachment of troops and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, came there with lanterns, torches, and weapons. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that would come upon him, went forward and said to them, Whom are you seeking? They answered and said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. And Judas, who betrayed him, also stood with him. Now when he had said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell on the ground. There's a sermon I have that's based on that one verse. Then he asked them again, who are you seeking? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus said, I have told you that I am he. Therefore, if you seek me, let these others go their way. You see, even at the time when he was going to be arrested, and we read in the passage, knowing the things that would happen to him, his concern was for them. These men have done nothing wrong. Let them go. It is in the suffering of Jesus Christ that we see his concern for you. 
Oftentimes in our lives, we wonder if anyone is concerned with us. We wonder if we have a friend at all or if our family or loved ones even care. And we think, well, nobody really has a concern for me, but Jesus has a concern for you. I promise you that. Lost or found, saved or unsaved, Jesus has a concern for you. and He wants you to be saved. That's why he put himself on that cross. He's concerned for every part of your life. We've seen maybe in the past someone that's been in a car wreck. Maybe their family was with them. When they come to, they, you know, where they are in the hospital, they ask, how's my family? You know, without even getting a report on how they are, how's my family? And we see concern for others as being a natural human tendency at times. But in the suffering of Jesus Christ, in the great fear that he must have had, knowing that what was going to happen, wanted his followers, his friends, to be let go. That's amazing to me. And I love that about Christ. I love that about his personality. I love that about his caring because we can see that we need to be concerned for others regardless of what's happening to us. We need to show care and concern. As we move on, we can see in the suffering and we can see the suffering of Jesus Christ in his trials. The trials that he had, they were mock trials. Now, I don't know if you've ever had to stand trial, uh, and if you've ever had to stand trial, and if you know uh, a little bit about the law and the courts, being on trial can be very scary. Uh, even if you're not guilty, and you know in your heart that you're not guilty, having to go on trial for something is, is, would cause a lot of anxiety. There is a lot of anxiety that's related. We've seen on, maybe you watch court television. I, I don't happen to watch it. I've watched it a few times. But in these courtrooms, these trials that take place, regardless of the guilt or innocence of the person on trial, it's an anxious time. They, there's no telling what can happen, right? There, there's a feeling of, of unease. And especially if you're not guilty, like Jesus was not guilty, it has to be torture to have to go through that. Even a fair trial causes anxiety. And these, these trials were in no way fair. Jesus was led to Annas, who was a powerful high priest at the time. In John 18, verse 22, we see him being led there. It says, when we had said these things, one of, them, one of the officers who stood by struck Jesus with the palm of his hand. Do you answer the high priest like that? You see, they took Jesus before the high priest, and the high priest had a question for him. He asked him in verse 19 about his disciples and his doctrine. Jesus answered him in verse 20 and said, I spoke openly to the world. I've always taught in the synagogues and in the temple where the Jews always met. And in secret have I done nothing. Why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard me. What I said to them. Indeed, they know. You see, Jesus spoke his mind when he was on trial. He answered the question directly and bluntly, and he got slapped for it. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine? I've always said, if they arrest me, and I didn't do it, it's going to be all. It's going to be on Fox News. See, every everybody in the nation is going to know it, and the headlines going to going to say, "Preacher goes mad." Because I'm going to be hollering and screaming, I didn't do it, I didn't do it, I didn't do it. Do you have anything to say about it? I didn't do it. Of course, my attorney is going to be telling me to shut up. But I would go berserk if I were charged and convicted for something I did not do. Jesus answered a question and he got smacked in the face. Don't answer the high priest like that. Can you imagine speaking out in court and instead of the, the judge banging his gavel and saying, order, that the bailiff come over there and knock you in the head? That's what happened. That's the mockery of the trial that he was in. The mockery of the trial. Jesus was brought before Caiaphas. And the council. You see, they, you know the story, and I don't want to tarry long 
on that part of it, but he was led back and forth. When they found no fault, they would just send him somewhere else. And in Luke chapter 22, in verse 63 and 64, we see him being led before Caiaphas. Now the men who held Jesus mocked him and beat him. And having blindfolded him, they struck him on the face, asked him, saying, Prophesy, who is the one who struck you? And many other things they blasphemously spoke against him. You see this trial that he had to endure? Not being convicted, but sent to another leader, then beaten and struck and mocked. The suffering of Jesus Christ, your motivation... For your faithfulness in his suffering can be seen in his trials, in the trials that he went through. All death sentences needed Roman approval, so he was sent to Pilate, and he was found not guilty. So they said, well, take him to Herod. They were bound and determined to find him guilty of something so they could kill him. He was slapped. He was mocked, he was paraded, and it says many other things, and we don't know. We don't know what other things. In his trials, we see that Herod enjoyed making fun of Jesus, found no fault in him, put a robe on him, and sent him back to Pilate. In Luke chapter 23, beginning in verse 6, we see another section of the mock trials. When Pilate heard of Galilee, he asked if the man were a Galilean. And as soon as he knew that he belonged to Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who was in Jerusalem at that time. Now when they saw Jesus, he was exceedingly glad, for he desired a long time to see him, because he had heard many things about him and hoped to see him do a miracle. Then he questioned him with many words, but he answered him nothing. The chief priest, in verse 10, the chief priests and scribes stood and vehemently accused him. Then Herod, with, this, with his men of war, treated him with contempt and mocked him, arrayed him in a gorgeous robe, and sent him back to Pilate. That very day, Pilate and Herod became friends with each other, for previously they had been at enmity. Pilate and Herod had a good old time doing this, didn't he? They seemed to enjoy what was going on, and by the way, they made a friendship together. These were mock trials, folks. And the suffering that we see in Jesus Christ, we can see in his mock trials. Pilate knew Jesus was innocent. He tried to use Barabbas as a way to escape the release of Jesus. So he had Pilate, Pilate had Jesus scourged. We see that in Matthew 27, beginning in verse 26. I'm sorry, in verse 20. Matthew chapter 27, beginning in verse 20. But the chief priests and elders persuaded the multitudes that they should ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor answered and said to them, Which of the two, which of the two do you want me to release? They said, Barabbas. And Pilate said to them, What then shall I do with Jesus, who is called Christ? And he said, They all said to him, Let him be crucified. Now that sentence will become very significant in Acts chapter 2. They all said, Let him be crucified. The Holy Spirit could have used many other words there. They all said, let him be crucified. When, Christ, when Peter professed on Pentecost, this Jesus, whom ye crucified, he meant it. Because they all had called for the crucifixion of Christ. They were all guilty. Just as you and I stand guilty. Romans 6, verse 23, of sin. Until we find the blood of Christ, we all stand in need of a Savior. They all said, Barabbas, let him be crucified. 
Then the governor said, Why, what evil has he done? But they cried out still all the more, saying, Let him be crucified. When Pilate saw that he could not prevail at all, but rather that a tumult was rising, he took water, washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I'm innocent of the blood of this person, this just person. You see to it. Very significant sentence. You see to it. You and I, in our sin, put Jesus on the cross. His own kinfolk and his own brethren put him there. In the suffering of Jesus, we can see his suffering in these mock trials. And, and they delivered him to be crucified. The people answered, verse 25, His blood be on us and on our children. Then he released Barabbas to them. And when he had scourged Jesus, he offered him to be crucified. Now I understand that there are young children in this audience. Okay? So, in a heart of compassion, I'm going to move quickly through this and not be as descript and as as I've heard this sermon be preached. Okay? There's a way to choose our words. But the suffering of Jesus and the motivation that you have in being spiritually fit can be seen on that cross. And it can be seen in His care that He had for others, His concern for others. It can be seen on what He had to endure in those mock trials, and it can be seen on how He was treated, His torture. You know, when he said he scourged Jesus and gave him to be crucified, that scourging involves a lot of things that I'm going to pass by for the sake of our young people. But it's a terrible whipping. And the device that they used was a special device. They had typically glass and shards on it when they whip you with it. Then they mock him by putting on a robe and that crown of thorns, you think how that, if you, I've been stuck in a briar patch, I don't know if you ever have, but I've been out and about and I've gotten stuck in a, in a thistle of, of thorns, okay? It's very painful, all right? All those things sticking in you, if they twist that thing on your head, imagine how that's going to feel and mock him with the robe. Then he had, remember the passage about carrying a cross? And then he fell under its weight and somebody else had to carry it. The journey that he made back and forth. Then he, they got spat on. And I don't know if that's ever happened to you or if you've ever had somebody do that to you. But that's a, the most degrading thing that someone can do. If you think about it, they spat on him. And oftentimes we, and I'm guilty of this too, we read through this passage about the, the, uh, the torture and the crucifixion of Christ and we take from it the things that we should and we gloss through it and we don't stop and think about every little thing that he had to endure. If someone spits on you, your natural reaction, I can tell you what we would do in Rolling Brook, all right? It's tough not to want to get back. But to be spat upon is the worst. It's the worst. Well, wait a minute. Maybe it's not. They stripped him down. Now, again, I want to be careful here. But that's embarrassing. To have all of your clothes taken off of you in a crowd of people. Think about that. Can, can you imagine the Christ, the Savior of the world, having his clothes torn off and being spat upon? And then the nails go in. And the cross that he's hung on. We see the suffering of Jesus and the love that he has for us in the torture that he endured. Like I said, it's a, it's a tough thing to think about. Every first day of the week, guess what? Each, katamein sabaton, each and every first day of the week, 
the Lord Jesus Christ asked us to remember this. Remember this. This do in remembrance of me. I give my body for you. This blood is the blood of the new covenant. I'm doing this for you. And it's something that he asked us to remember every week. I suggest that in other places in Scripture, we're taught to remember it every day. But certainly, as a memorial, we do that every first day of the week when we partake in the communion together. Now, not only was he scourged, embarrassed, uh, spat upon, stripped down naked, which is embarrassing enough in itself, and had the nails driven in and hung there on the cross, just for good measure, they jabbed him in the side with a spear. The suffering of Jesus can be seen in the torture that he endured. And our love for him and our motivation for him to, to, to be a better Christian. We need to examine the cross. When we preach the cross, certainly we preach the resurrection. Oh, glorious day. Three days later, the tomb was empty. I love those sermons. Those are my favorite sermons. But we can't skip the nails. You can't skip that. You can't skip the spit. You can't skip the spear. You can't skip that stuff. Oh, he died a brutal death on the cross. Yeah, he did. That's where your motivation is, to be a fit and faithful Christian. God did the resurrecting, and that proves that Jesus is who he is. And it proves the church. It proves every prophecy. It proves it. But the spear is your motivation. The pain, the mock, the trials, all of his care for you and his concern. If that had not happened, if, we, if, that, if he had not endured that pain, there would be no eternity in heaven for us. Through the cross, God shows the ugliness of sin. It was the worst day and three days later was the best day, and I'll get to that sermon very soon. It was the worst day in the history of the world. There's a sermon that I preach about the miracles that happened when Jesus died, and that day will be forever remembered. But God shows us through the ugliness of the cross, the ugliness of sin. The wages of sin, if you have sin in your life that's unrepented of or is untaken care of by the blood of Christ, what you will receive, and we learn in our minor prophet study this morning, and as it pr proceeds, God exacts judgment on peoples. What you will receive for that sin is death, eternal, eternal death, unreconcilable sin, unreconciled sin, the wages of that is death. And through the cross, we see sin. We can see sin as God saw sin. In Isaiah chapter 59, we see in verse 1 and 2, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, nor his ear heavy that it cannot hear. But listen to this, your iniquities have separated you from God. God takes sin very seriously, and it separates you from Him. And your sins have hidden His face from you, so that He will not hear. This is the very first time that we see that Jesus, on the cross, was forsaken by God. He had the sins of the world all over him. And God can't even look at him. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because of sin. You have the sin of the world all over you. That's why he died. It is the plan of God. And we see a statement of despair and despondency. I'll bet it was loud. I'll bet he hollered that as loud as could be. 
I don't think it was a whisper. I wasn't there and I don't know. But you know what? Every other thing that happened on that day, the veil being torn, the, the darkness, the thunder, everything else was loud and everybody else knew it when it was happening. I'll bet that was loud when he said it. Why have thou forsaken me? It's the first time in the life of Christ when we see that God did not aid him when he needed it. And there was a purpose. The purpose was fulfillment of prophecy. The purpose was salvation. We see salvation on that cross that day when he told the thief, today you'll be with me in paradise. There's that glimpse, there's that flicker, there's that vision, there's that sight of eternity. That we see. Even on the cross of Christ, we see heaven and paradise. He told the, the thief that he'd be with him. It is ne that thief, boy, he got close, didn't he? It is never too late until you draw your last breath to come to Christ. It is never too late. You might think, well, I'm too old. I've lived too long. I've done too much. That's foolishness. It's never too late to come to Christ. In Matthew chapter 11, we see that Jesus says, Come unto me, all ye who are heavy laden. And I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I'm gentle and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Christians have a Savior who have their best interests in mind. And Jesus Christ has your best interests in mind this morning. We see it on the cross. We see it as he said for those that were around him, let them go. We see it when he looked down at his mom. Then looked at John and said, take care of my mother. We see that until we learn his true suffering and pain and serve him. It is until then when we will enter the true heart of Calvary. It's through the pain and suffering of Jesus Christ that we see His love for us. He loves you, but I promise you that if you have sin in your life, God loves you, but His face is hidden from you. You need to resolve that. If, if there's a need that you have for prayer, if there's a need that you have for repentance, if there's a need that you have for any reason, Lay it at the foot of that cross. Lay it at the foot of that cross. If you are a Christian that has not been spiritually fit, if you've forgotten or not studied or, or, or really not taken in consideration the pain and suffering that Jesus had to endure and it's maybe not meant as much to you as it should, maybe if it's something of a public nature that you need to respond to, we're going to sing a song. If you need to rededicate your life to Christ or become a Christian by believing in Him and obediently confessing His good name and repenting of your sins, we'll baptize you and your sins will be washed away, Acts twenty two sixteen, 16, and you'll be added to the church. If you have a need, if you'd like to respond, we're going to sing a song, be coming as we stand together and as we sing. On behalf of the Longville Road Church of Christ, I want to thank you for joining us today for our worship. If you ever have an opportunity, we invite you to join us at our physical location at 1301 Lawnville Road in Kingston, Tennessee. We hope you will come experience the simplicity of New Testament Christianity, learn about God, and become a part of His family. If you have questions, if you would like to know more about the Bible, or if you would like a home Bible study, feel free to contact us by calling 865-717-0444. Or, for more information, visit our website, www.lawnvilleroadcoc.org. Again, we thank you, and we hope you have a blessed day.